things that happen at this time of year. First of all, I want to thank each and every father that is here. As fathers, we are meant to be a representation of the great Father in heaven. Amen. And I know that we don't do as good a job as we could, but the Lord still works with us. And each and every one of you gentlemen are necessary in this church. Without you, this church fails. Amen. Now ladies, in this case, uh, since it's Father's Day, you've got the backup role. Amen. And no father can do it without a good wife. Amen. So, the next thing is, there's a number of you who have been graduating at this time. Every single father loves to see his kids when they graduate. You put a lot of effort in there to see them get to this point. Young people that are graduating, this is not the end. I believe that because you're graduating, God is calling you to greater service. Amen. So I would like to invite all of those who are graduates to become more part of God's work. Now, before I go any farther on the sermon, I want to tell you that we're going to have prayer at the end of the service. We're going to pray for faith in the church. Amen? Amen. I believe in prayer. There would be no hope for Pastor Peterson without prayer. And by the way, thank you so much, Judy. I appreciate everyone who prays for me. Um, it's just like last night, um, Marvin gave his phone to someone I didn't know. I got to talk to Katie last night. She's having a personal problem in her life. And when I had a chance to pray with someone I don't know. But I know that in sharing my faith, I help someone else's faith out. It was a time where two cultures were colliding. Pax Romana was being passed out through all the land. If you don't know what that means, that means the Roman peace. And it was something that was forced upon everyone along the way, in much the same way that we have Pax Americana right at this point. We are trying to push our peace across the whole world so that everyone will be at peace with what is going on. But in order to keep that peace, what do you have to do? Either you're going to get everyone involved with it, and, you know, everyone's going to peacefully say, yeah, but I want to have peace, no problem, and everyone tries to be peaceful with everyone. How good does that do? If you heard over this last week, you heard that the uh, head of the leader in the Senate got out there and said that we are providing peace for this world with our military. It is no different than what happened with Rome and what Rome did. Pax Romana. But what happens when cultures come and meet one another? We find along the way that there's pushback, isn't there? Did the Jews enjoy having Romans involved with what was going on with their lives? The Romans were saying along the way, we expect you to worship our gods. Who was the god of Rome at that point? Caesar. You were to bow down to Caesar and claim him as the one who provided all the bounties that you had. Do the Jews believe in that? And so there was naturally this problem with culture, just like we are facing in this day and age. And yet, one of the great problems that the Jews had is here they were, they knew what was in God's word, but, but, when Jesus showed up upon the scene, did they recognize Jesus? 
I put up there John chapter 4 and verse 48, and this was talking when Jesus was talking to a, a Jewish noble, and he was making it clear that what did the Jews expect? Except you see what? Signs and wonders. Ye will not believe. We're not too much different. Folks, I believe that we are living in the last days. I believe that the signs and wonders are all around us, just as Jesus talked about. But some people are going to say to me, oh, but pastor, we believe that if we're going to be in the end times, we're going to see the Sunday laws. Well, folks, you may find along the way that the Sunday laws get snuck in on you some way along the way, and we should be paying attention to what Jesus said. You will see these type of signs. What did he, he say? There will be wars and rumors of war. There will be earthquakes. There will be troubles all over the place. Are we not living in that time? We are living in the last days, folks. The last of any of the time prophecies is done and over with. We are living in the time just before Jesus comes. As one person says, we're living on the edges of the toenails. You all know what that refers back to, don't you? The image in Daniel chapter 2. I believe that we are there. And so here comes Jesus at this time of Pax Romana, and yet at the time, even with the peace, he is coming around and he is talking about the kingdom of God. I think that we need to learn from Jesus and we need to talk about the kingdom of God. Amen? Amen. And after Jesus has finished with giving one of his speeches, he is coming back to Capernaum. He came back to Capernaum as a place of refuge. So he's coming back there. And when he comes back there, the Bible picks up it in 7 and the 2nd chapter and you can find out that there was a centurion that was there in the uh, city of Capernaum. Now, the centurion, if you really want to know what he was, let's make it very clear right now. This centurion was the leading officer making sure that Pax Romana was in effect. I want you to understand the power that he had. He was the chief of police. He was the chief magistrate. He was the chief of the government. Everything that happened in the, that area was under his control. Everything that happened, everything that went on, he was in charge of it. He was responsible for everything that happened along the way. And how did the Romans tend to look at things? Most of the time what the Romans wanted to do is they wanted to pass out the culture of Greece with a Latin flavor. Is that a good way to say it? It's just like, folks, if, if you ever go to Texas, one thing you have to learn is you have to learn how to eat the chilies. you got to watch out for those little chili beans. The habaneros. They get the hot and everything like that. And I'm going to tell you along the way what, what is happening with this. If you've ever tried to put a hot chili in something, I'm going to guarantee you, you will know that it's in there. Amen? <laughs> and so the Romans wanted to make it clear that whatever was happening, you were going to follow the Greek way with the Latin flair. Those of you who come from Latino countries, you don't know this, but a lot of this comes back from Rome, the way they look at things. Yeah. Right? Think about it. <coughs> he was a man of status and power, but he did something different here in Capernaum than what most centurions did. This man took his time to learn the culture of the people. He went to the place of worship, and he didn't just go to the place of worship. He sat at the feet of the elders, and he 
let them share the scriptures and share the things that were there. He began to understand what the great God of heaven was. He was a compassionate man. As I told you before, four-fifths of the people in Rome were slaves. And how are slaves treated? They're treated like property, right? So folks, how do you treat your property? Now some of you, look folks, I can tell about how you, you handle a lot of your stuff just based upon how you handle your cars, right? How many of you change the oil right on time every single, according to the uh, manual? Or how many of you along the way go, I can get just a few more miles out of the oil, I can make it there. <laughs> I'm so grateful that we live in a country where we start looking at people as not as property but as individuals. And I want to tell you that the centurion was different than most men because he had compassion on his sick servant. And he knew that something needed to be done. As it says in the next few verses, Luke 7, verses uh, uh, 3 through 5, So when he heard about Jesus, he sent elders of the Jews to him, pleading with him to come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they begged him earnestly, saying that the one for whom he should do this for is deserving. And why is he deserving? Here was their reason. What is their reason? He loves our nation. And he built us a synagogue. Think about it, folks. Think about what they were saying here. Here they are coming the Son of God. They're coming to the one who is representing and showing the love of God to the world. They're coming to him. And what is their reason for going to make sure that Jesus would follow through? Think about it this way, folks. What if we treated everyone based upon how much tithe and offerings they gave to the church? You know, this is what they were basically saying along the way. This guy is willing to listen to us, so he's okay along the way. Have you ever noticed what has been happening along the way? If you will listen to one side or the other, everyone pulls you in and considers you to be a friend. They have a perception of what is going on, and they perceive that if something is happening a certain way, if we are living in a world today that is, has the perception that there is no God. We're living in a world that has the perception and everyone is saying along the way that we just evolved into what we are. There is no real moral folks. You can do whatever you want to do. Can you? I want to tell you something right now. I know what I believe in. Each one of us here were created by the great God of heaven. While we're still in our mother's womb, he knew what was going on. He saw each and every cell that was coming together. He has plans for us. He knows what is going on. He lovingly took the human beings, and when he created, he created man out of the dust of the ground. And then it says that he put his mouth over the nostril and the lips of the human being and breathed life into him. When you put your mouth anywhere close to someone's face and someone's mouth, you're being very intimate with them. Am I not correct? God has created us to be intimate with him, to know him, to understand what is going on. Folks, I believe that there is a great God of heaven, but if you notice what is going on today, perception is being run by the media. Have you ever noticed what is happening? They get a certain type of talking type of thing, and absolutely everyone goes out and says exactly the same thing until it goes out that we think that that is what is really true. 
So think about it. We're, uh, we're supposed to uh, be having a weather problem that is caused by all of the things that we burn out there. And so uh, everyone says it, so we should believe it. But folks, is that true? If I understand what they're saying, every uh, tornado that happens is because of global warming. The increase is global warming. If we have a bad cold winter, it's because of global warming. Now you tell me how ice cold and warming all go together, and I'll understand. But it's what the perception is, isn't it? Do you realize that not a single person can become a weather forecaster unless they believe in global warming? Did you know that? Did you know that? You believe in a perception that is put out there just because everyone says we're in the middle of global warming. And the problem is we are just like the Jews here that we have a perception. We can come to Jesus and think that what matters is that this man loves a nation and that he has built us a synagogue. Therefore, you should treat him nicely. But isn't this what we are preaching in some of our churches? You come to God, God's going to bless you. He'll give you all of these wonderful things. And if you're not blessed, it's because you're not one with God. So, if I get this, then know what that means. So no bad things should come our way, and the devil's not going to be active and work against the Christian. Right? I don't know, folks, from the time that I was baptized, the devil's been trying to work on me. Isn't that true? He doesn't give up. You see, too many times we have forgotten. Here are the elders of the church, and they have forgotten along the way who they belong to, who is in the first place. And they come to Jesus as if the only thing that this man is credible for is because he loves the nation and he's built the synagogue. I'm so glad that the story doesn't end there, does it? Jesus starts moving in that direction, following along with the elders of the church, starts moving closer and closer. People are gathered around him. Now, here's a divergence between the book of Matthew and the book of Luke. Luke says that a second, gen a second delegation is sent out from the centurion. The book of Matthew says that he personally came to Jesus. I don't know which is true. It may be the fact that if you send someone out, aren't those your words that are being spoken in the first place? He tells Jesus, please, do not come. I am not worthy to have you in my centurion God what was trying to be taught people of this church do you get what's being taught or is the self righteousness taken over in your lives and you think it is by what you do by what you profess by what desire of ages saw his own unworthiness and yet feared not to ask help. He trusted not in his own goodness. His argument was his great need. His faith took hold upon Christ in his true character. He did not believe in him merely as a worker of miracles. And folks, I specifically misspelled that word. 
Because I'm going to tell you right now, your pastor is not perfect. It's spelled with an A. I know it's wrong. I did it on purpose. But as the friend and savior of mankind, how often do we come to Jesus even in our prayers as if he is the miracle worker instead of being our friend and our savior who is so willingly came down from heaven and gave up everything that he had so that he could die the death that you deserve, that I deserve. I love where I read in the Bible that Jesus is, is waiting at the door, knocking at the door, wanting to come in. Folks, uh, my home, myself, I'm not worthy enough to have the master of the of my urgent needs do I ask God for God. Uh, we cannot make it in this world without Jesus. We can't survive what is going on. We're not going to be able to live through these last days without the help of Jesus Christ. And he was a man who understood it and said, please do not come any farther. I am not worthy to have you under my roof. But I trust in you. I'm a man of authority. I tell someone to go here, someone to go there, and they do it. And Lord, I believe and I trust that you will take care. Do you have that type of faith? Do you have that type of faith? You see, faith is based upon what? Faith is based upon what we believe and what we hope in. I'm going to tell you right now what pastor's hope is. I have the hope of seeing Jesus Christ come again. And I have the hope of seeing all of my family that has been laid to rest to be there as Jesus speaks the word. I have the hope and I am looking forward to go home with my, my, my great friend and savior Jesus Christ. I'm looking forward to go to a place that was not built or done by my plans or my dealings or anything that I did, but I'm planning to go to a place and I have the hope of Jesus Christ coming again. Everything that I, I believe in, I hope on this, and I want to say to you folks that I am relying upon this hope and I believe that it is going to happen. Faith reaches out and takes that which is belief, what is hope, and reaches out. And even though you can't see these things, trust that they're going to happen. Amen? Amen. I trust that, now folks, everyone that is here, have you touched the pearly gates yet? Has anyone here walked upon the streets of gold yet? Have any of you reached down and pulled water from the river of life yet? Have you plucked the fruit from the tree of life that has 12 different... Now, folks, I don't know. I heard that at camp meeting that, and, and Brother Rojas believes that there's going to be 12 manners of peppers on the tree. <laughs> I don't know. It just says that there's fruit. Who knows? Whatever it's going to be, it's going to be the best thing that we've ever tasted. I know, folks, if I, if I plant an apple tree in my backyard and I go out looking for bananas, but, folks, I haven't seen it, but I believe and so by faith, I'm going to tell you the day is going to happen. I'm going to reach out, and I'm going to go to that tree of life, and I'm going to pick the fruit that's good for me. Good for you. Amen? Amen. Do you believe it? Do you trust it? Do you have hope in it? Are you looking forward to it? We forget along the way, and too often we deal with the things of earth when we need to deal with the more lofty things, the things that are more hope. Are we worthy of it? Absolutely not, except for Jesus Christ. Without him, I am absolutely the most worthless person in the world. And I know it. 
and I need Jesus, and I am constantly going on my knees, asking that Jesus will come into my life and to take care of me. And I'm going to talk about the greatest thing that we can have faith in next week. Hold your horses. I'm not going to share it all in one sermon. I'm going to read these words, and I'll ask you again to turn to Luke chapter 7, verses, uh, verse 9 especially. And when Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him and turned around and said to the crowds that followed him, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. Fellow Christians, is there that type of great faith in this church? Or would Jesus have to see someone who is not a member of this church who has that type of faith that God is going to act? like Jesus saw that day with that century. There was no one else that he had seen in Israel that had the type of faith of the cemetery. Shame on us, folks. Too many times we are like the Jews. We learn the words. We know the do's and don'ts. We go through life. And yet how many of us have really experienced the great God who loves us so that he comes down and he's willing to enter into our feeble hearts and willing to come in there and dwell there and be a part of us. He believed that Jesus would act in if you go to if you go to Matthew it says that when he, he got home he found that the, that the servant was healed and he asked the hour and he found out at the exact time that Jesus spoke the words. In Luke you find out that what happens is that when the delegation got back here is the servant. What is the servant doing? The servant is doing the servant's work. Now folks, we often go to the hospital in order to get healed from something and what happens? You go right back to work. You got to heal up from the healing, right? Isn't that the truth? Well, I'm going to tell you that when Jesus heals, how does he heal? And by the way, in the, in the same chapter where it talks about the centurion in the book of Desire of Ages, and I would encourage you to read this, she also talks about to the widow of Nain. And I believe that right now, Jesus is ready to restore life into each of our hearts. We need it, folks, because what type of hearts do we have? We have hearts of what? Hearts of what? And Jesus needs to come in, and Jesus needs to give us a heart transplant. And I believe that Jesus can breathe into us and take our hearts of stone and turn it into beating flesh that belongs to him. Amen? Yes. Folks, this church needs to be healed. I have been desperately praying for this church. I've been praying for you. This church needs to be changed around. This church needs to belong to Jesus Christ 100% and we are not there yet. We need to be people who are living by faith and we are not there yet. And so I'm asking you, are we able to be in the same league as the centurion in Capernaum? Are we able to be to that point where we will have that type of faith? You all know what it says in Hebrews 11, verse 1. But I'm going to ask you to turn there again, because this is the thing that all of the ancients were commended for. Is that the truth? What it says there, now faith is what? 
Faith is what? Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things what? Not seen. And this is why I'm telling you folks, I have hope. I haven't ever seen Jesus Christ come again, but I have my hope there. And so every day I'm believing that I am getting prepared for Jesus Christ to come. What about you? I believe that there is a place that God has created for me. A place where he wants to take me. And I'm acting by faith that I'm going in that direction. What about you folks? We have this great need. How many of us are in desperation? How many of us have harmful, hurtful things that have been said that we are holding in our heart? And we need to turn it all over to Jesus Christ so that he can change us and take that hurt and pain and things away from us. When Kate got on the phone last night, she had a lot of pain and hurt that she has. And folks, I can't change that. But I know who can. And I have faith that he can take care of any problem. Folks, what do you believe in? If you believe that you want to earn a million dollars, you'll do it. If you believe that you need to gain silver and gold in order to protect you in these last days, you can do it. But if you have faith in those type of things, folks, it's here today and gone tomorrow. I have a hope and a greater thing that will last the age. See, I have a hope in a city where there will be no potholes in the streets. The other day, I'm trying to get Mrs. Peterson from Rex Hospital, and you have to go up Lake Boone Road, off of 440, and you couldn't get through, folks. Now, I know I'm new to the area. I knew I wanted to get to where Mrs. Peterson was, so I said a word of prayer, and the Lord helped me to get by there and get to where Mrs. Peterson was so I could pick her up. I like having her around with me, amen? amen. Dad, I want to talk to you about your children. You believe along the way that you can do everything for your kids, and I'm going to tell you that you will soon find out that the moment that they get their own minds, <sighs> I was talking to someone whose daughter just turned 13. I'm giving him encouragement and saying, you'll make it just barely. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you what I do with my children each and every day. I get down on my knees and I place them into the Lord's hand. I ask the Lord to put a, a, a fence around them and keep them safe. And I have to leave my children there. Because I can't do anything more for them. When they call, I'll try and talk to them, give them the fatherly advice. But I have to leave them in Jesus. Put your children in Jesus. Because I believe that when you put them there, you can have faith in it. He'll take care of your children. Amen. Faith acts on hope. And I want to tell you that I have hope that the Lord will have my children ready to go with me. When Jesus comes again. Are we ready to be commended? Not because of our good, but because we understand our unworthiness. Like the centurion. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Dear Father, now, we come before you. 
I know, dear Father, as the, as, as the pastor of this church, that I am also a worthy. And like the centurion, I come in my need, dear Father, to have you as my Lord and Savior. And now I pray for each person in this church right now, dear Father. I pray that in our need, that we will rely upon you and trust you. If you want to act out on your hope of Jesus Christ in return, I ask you right now, just raise your hands. Reach up to heaven. Say to the Lord in this prayer that you want to, to reach out in faith and pray that he will come into your lives, unworthy as you are, and make you more and more like Jesus each day. Amen. Reach down and touch our hands, dear Father. And I pray this all in Jesus Christ's precious and holy name. Be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you. 